Hello and welcome again to True Footy Podcast 38 and today we have the grandest of episodes, Busher. Of course, this is our grand final edition podcast. Pre-grand final. Pre-grand final, yes, of course, yeah. Yes. Um, we will do a post-grand final one. Um, we'll see how we go next Monday, but uh, for today, we've got a, lot of bit, a little bit to catch up on. Um, mm-hmm. Two great prelims. They're cracking games, that's for sure. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we said it at the time, but... Whenever we do a live stream, we've been treated to a really good game. I think I worked it out. I think we've done like four or five live streams and 20 points was the biggest blowout. And I think the other four were all 10 points or less. Yeah, single di- a lot of single digit games, yeah. single goal. Which like. is funny because like, I remember Caden complaining earlier in this year that because he does a Friday night live yeah. stream, he didn't have a good game up until like round 15 or something. Yeah. So yeah, we were very blessed uh, in that sense. But um, huge week for the channel as well. Definitely. Because grand final week is huge for AFL on YouTube, so um, there's a lot of pressure on us to do a good job. Yeah, a lot of other people putting out good content we've got to keep up. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, yeah. But we are the best. No, not really. We um, we did put out that AFL grand final promo video, which is doing really well. Yeah. So go check that out if you haven't already. Um, really, um, we're going to do another live stream this week as well. During the Brownlow, so rather than cover the Brownlow too much during this podcast, Bush, um, we'll save yeah. that for, t- for tonight's Bri- Brownlow live stream, and we've got a few juicy bets that I'm, if yeah. my oh, actually I'll talk about it in the live stream, but I was going to say I could win a lot of money if um if my Brownlow prediction is correct. I um, wish I had a bit more money to work with at this stage of the game. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, well that I spent gonna... a bit too much on beers after the last live stream. Yeah, oh that's <laughs> right. Yeah, true. Yeah. There were a few secret beers in that live stream and some nice not so secret beers. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, as I said, two great prelims. First of all, Richmond and Geelong on the Friday night was a cracking game. And it was probably the, the lesser of the two games in terms of a spectacle, but it was still a really good game. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Cats obviously got the jump on Richmond and in the first half probably looked like themselves in the first half of the year before they started going win-loss, win-loss, win-loss. Um, and it did look like a realistic proposition at one point that Richmond were going to bow out in consecutive prelims, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, that that was the thing for me. I just thought Richmond's heartbreak from last year's prelim where, you know, they say, well, people have said that 2018 was the year that they were sort of washed away with history. They went 18 mm. and four and obviously bundled out spectacularly at the hands of Collingwood um, in the prelim this year. And I thought if they let this year go begging as well, that would be an absolute disaster. But they absolutely kicked it in the second half. I think they kicked five goals to start the third term. And I think once they kind of clawed their way back, I pretty much had no doubt. Mm, they Richmond... felt confident once they were back in it. Exactly, exactly. Um, so this Richmond side has gained a Tom Lynch since last year. And he was huge. Uh, people have been, you know, hyping him up, saying how good would Tom Lynch be in a final series? Well, he's delivered he kicked five goals. Um, Basha Huli and Dion Prestia as well, among the best players. I did see that Dusty got rated player of the game by the fi- by fans. That's a bit Did you sad. think that was weird? A bit sad. <clears throat> it's one of those ones every 10-year-old goes, Oh, Dusty, I'm going to vote for Dusty. I like him. He has tattoos. <laughs> yeah, that will, exactly. Well, evidently, because, uh, I mean, he did have two goals in 28 possessions, uh-huh. but we did our player of the finals voting, uh-huh. and he cracked one vote between three of us, I uh-huh. think, and it was me. Um, so, on the other hand, though, the best player on the ground, I thought, was actually a player on the losing side, and that was Tim Kelly. Yeah, I had the same, I believe. Mm, yeah, I think we unanimously voted him BOG for 150 dream team points, three goals and 31 possessions. Probably one of his best performances in the blue and white. I'm a bit spewing, actually, because I did have the same game multi happening for that game with a couple of extra spare bucks I had before I burnt through it all. But I had... Dangerfield, three goals, because I assumed he'd be playing a more prominent forward role. Mm. Kelly, the 30 touches. I should have just gone Kelly for both. Yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah I probably would have had it, except Geelong just lost the line. Because I had the Richmond, a Geelong line, but they just blew the line in the end. Yeah, that's true. It was like 18 points. They ended up losing by 20 or whatever it was. Yeah. But yeah, they were lost by uh, 19, I think. Yeah, they just blew the line. I know that. Um, but enough about Shane Mumford. <laughs> <laughs> Sausage. <laughs> um, anyway. For those of you that watched the live show the other day, I did utter that phrase a few times throughout. Yeah, he was a couple of beers deep and uh, that's, that noise started happening. Um, <laughs> Tim Kelly, though, one of the great performances in the blue and white. Is it his last game for the club, do you think? Probably, I'd say. Yeah. And they've also got a few ageing players like Ablett and Taylor. Yeah. Um, 
Taylor's retiring, isn't he? I don't know. Uh, Somebody said on the live stream, but I haven't found it anywhere. So uh, I'm just going to assume for now, no. But let us know in the comments if uh, I've somehow missed that article. But, you know, it's still like not ruled out that he could yeah. retire. Obviously, Ablett. I feel like Ablett could go around again. Yeah. It's just about whether he wants to, but I think he's good enough to. Mm. Um, but generally, Geelong do have a lot of aging players. How do you think they'll reflect on this season? And going forward, what's your outlook for them, do you think? This is probably their best opportunity they've had and probably will with their team as currently constructed, I think. Mm. Unless they do something big like bring in a Jack Stephen or something like that in the trade period, this it, is probably as close as they'll get as constructed, I think. Yeah, They'd I They'd have to make some adjustments, some personnel changes, I think. To Yeah, they do have a lot of their... Well, not a lot of their best players, but enough of their best players like around the 30 mark for it to be mm-hmm. a little bit of a concern. I understand their policy this offseason will probably be the stockpile draft picks, um, which is wise, I think. Um, they've done a really good job of bringing in youth over the last couple of years. Um, despite being an old team, they do have a lot of good young players. Grian Myers has played really, really well. He did go down a little bit easy when mm-hmm. Bashar Hooli hit him. Um, so to speak. I, I saw an angle on that where it looked like he did cop one in the temple. It in the temple? looked like he got hit in the temple a little. My perspective on it was that he went down easy, but I don't think he dived. I think it hurt him, yeah. but he just looked a bit it looked The angle a bit they soft. picked, and then the crowd fucking hammed it up as well. Yeah, they did. They went hard at him. But yeah. to his credit... I, I think he got... It looked like he got whacked to me. Okay. I reckon. Fair enough. I thought it looks... He went down a bit easy, but it probably hurt. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it just looked bad. But nonetheless, I thought he came back really well from that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so... My view, though, is, yeah, like you said, it's a really big off-season for Geelong now. Um, I think they're good enough to go around again. I don't think Dangerfield's slowing down. Well, yeah, I mean, he will Dangerfield slow down eventually. Slow. I, still, I said before that I think he's the number one player in the game, and I think he will win the Brownlow right now. I think he's slightly ahead of five. He's the favourite. He is a favourite, yes. Right. I just thought I just think he's, he's the best, and he will hopefully carry that forward into the coming years. I don't think he's slowing down. But like you say, with Tim Kelly going out, he's such an important player for them and uh, they're going to need to bring in someone like a Jack mm. Stephen as a minimum. Um, I've also heard another one of the young kids, he has, he's been in and out of the side, but he's one that if they do give him a consistent crack, I could see him being really good and constable. Yeah, I've heard yeah. he wants out for more senior opportunities. Yeah, which I think would be a mistake from his perspective. I think he's at a good club. Um who have a good history of developing young players. He just needs to be a little bit patient because the exodus, not the exodus, but the drop-off Geelong is coming in the next couple of years. Yeah. Joel Selwood's like 30-odd. Um, it's going to be a time where he's going to get his opportunity. Yeah. It's not worth, in my opinion, moving to perhaps a more risky sort of club like a St Kilda or North. Melbourne, I think, was one I'd Okay, yeah. See, see, Melbourne, no disrespect yeah. to Melbourne, they don't have the same track record of getting the most out of the young players as Geelong does. Uh, so if he's happy at the club and he just wants more opportunity, I think he should stay at the Cats. But anyway, we're kind of getting on a tangent yeah. there. I think Geelong will definitely reflect on this season as a missed opportunity and they're going to have to be creative. But I think, they, I think they've done a good job of preparing for this, this transition they're about mm. to go through because, like I said, they've got a lot of good youth. Second prelim final was an absolute belter. Absolutely. We did the live stream and, uh, God, it was a good live stream. We did 122 people jumped on at the same time. It's got over 4,000 Right at minutes. the end of the game when it was, yeah. everything was happening. Absolutely huge effort um, for everyone to join us. So thank you for doing that. We had a lot of fun. Um, the game itself, it was really low scoring first half. Um, I think it was three goals to two at half time. No one could really take the ascendancy up until about the third quarter. And it appeared the Giants had absolutely blown Collingwood out of the water with that third term. And I think it got out to about 33 points, the margin in the end. The Pies obviously clawed it back. There was a contentious... They got it within one goal with 10 left and they just could not kick that last goal. That yeah, was... that's true. Yeah. And things would have been very different if that Taylor Adams point where it hit the post had gone through, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me, just because the goals had really dried up. Or if Chris Maynard had nailed that goal attempt. He True. looked devastated after the game. Yeah, I he did was feel balling. I did feel bad. Um I did feel bad for Taylor Adams. There was a lot of talk about that uh that non touch, which was a howler because it was clearly touched. Mm. Um thankfully it didn't inf- influence the game. But the other way to look at that is that Finn Layson probably did shove Grundy in the back to goal it out of the ruck. Yeah. If you remember the contest yeah. I'm talking about. So, you know, you take yeah. him and you, you lose some as yeah. well. Nick Haynes, again, was probably 
Not BOG. I think we all voted Grundy BOG, yeah. but Nick Haynes has had an amazing final series. He's almost he's kind of making people maybe second guess their choice not to have him in the All Australian team. Definitely, um, he's probably he's definitely taking that personally and performing yeah. accordingly. I'd say he's been fantastic. Um, but we did have Grundy BOG with an amazing twenty five possession and seventy three hit out performance, and we said that before. Yeah. If Rich, if you told us at the start of the game, Grundy had twenty five possessions. 73 hitouts. you think Collingwood won White by a few goals at least. Um, but, you know, that GWS effort was humongous. Um, it's good, I think, as well, the Toby Green controversy can be forgotten about now uh. because he missed the game and they still won. Mm. You know what I mean? So people will not reflect on it maybe as controversially as if, you know, GWS had lost by a point. They were like, oh, Toby yeah. Green should have played. The irony is yeah. Toby Green probably shouldn't have played against Brisbane and he was best yeah. on ground. So, you know, but it doesn't matter. GWS, of course, make their first ever grand final from sixth, which is an incredible effort. Third versus sixth, this grand final combination, which is pretty rare. I don't know how many times it's happened before, but not too many, I'm guessing. But if we reflect on Collingwood before we get into the the actual grand final, uh, where does it leave Collingwood and how will they reflect on this season? They've got a few ins coming back into their side, so they're not dire straits not reach the pinnacle and on their way down. They can sustain this for another couple of years, I feel. Just, even as I think we said it on the live stream, we'll discuss an idea where you just got to stay in the hunt mm. for a few years and then your opportunity will come if you can keep yourself in the hunt. One year the path will clear yeah, and you get a good shot at the flag. That's so right. as long as they've got the ability to keep themselves in that hunt and mm. hopefully that window opens for them while they've got the talent to keep the door open. They looked absolutely devastated, including Eddie Maguire. And I know that some players have said since that that this was actually probably harder for them to take than the grand final loss last year. I think probably because you have that whole year of that narrative of redemption. You know, we lost last year, but we're going to overcome that and and do it this year. And then they they were probably given a preliminary final fixture that on on form lines, you'd probably have thought that's probably the best possible prelim they could have got. You know, going into the finals, GWS were... I ranked them the seventh most likely to win the flag out of eight in my video. And I'm sure other people, there weren't too many other people disagreeing with that too strongly. Uh, you know, most people would have thought Brisbane were the easier opponent, uh, sorry, the harder opponent for Collingwood. So I, w- I just wonder if maybe they had their eyes set on, you know, we got Richmond next uh, week if we just beat GWS. Uh, and GWS, you know, threw everything at them and they were too good. So I think it will hurt Collingwood really, really badly. But like you say, the list is stacked with talent. I have them in my top four again next year, but let's hope there's no mental scarring right. because that would be, it is a brutal way to, to lose your opportunity to win a grand final. Now let's have a little look at the actual grand final combination. At the start of the prelims, I think I said that if Richmond played GWS in the grand final, that would be my least favorite combination because I thought it would be a shit grand final. I don't know if I still think that now that GWS have put in that effort. Last time these two sides met, uh, they, so they've played twice this year. GWS clobbered them in round three by 10 goals, uh, nine goals at um, in Sydney. Oh. But in round 17, the Tigers got their revenge at the MCG, winning by 27 points. Let's have a look at Richmond first. Huh? Looking at their year, um, it started disastrously. Health of- related issues, obviously, not, not yeah. necessarily club issues, just health issues that. So you can sort of simplify that one a little. Sure. A bit more slack for the shit stars, sort I of think. For sure. They, we, Rancid is ACL in round one. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine how he'd be feeling right now. They were belted by the Pies in round two. They were belted by GWS, like I said. They were belted by the Dogs. Um, they were, and that this is all in the first half of the year. They lost to North by like seven goals, six goals. They smashed by Geelong and they were smashed by Adelaide. So the halfway point on the Pie, they were seven and six. And I think their percentage would have been... Maybe even less than 100. Meh. I'm not too sure off the top meh. of my head. Um, since then, they've turned it on and they haven't lost since, which is ridiculous. Mm. And I think there was a weird stat how they were almost on the same ladder position mid-year in 2017 uh, and they were this year. So like, Yeah, I remember them being in that 90-type spot yeah. midway the year they won it. That's right. Um, what they did have this year was players standing up in the absence of others. So 
we said Rance. Grimes probably stood up and is probably the best defender all year over the course of the year, in my opinion. Him and Hooley both stepped yeah. up in that back line, I'd say. You can't give it all to Grimes. No, but Grimes stood up. As a key, I guess. As a key in the yeah. absence of, of Rance, whereas Hooley's yeah. kind of always been that really, really good. But Hooley's game's defender. elevated, I think, this year compared to. You think it's elevated? Because I think he's always been really, really good. The past couple of years, I feel he's elevated, but this year without Rance, yeah. he's had a lot more of the ball, like. Yeah, okay, I agree with that, actually. He probably, I think he has had his statistically his best year, and I think it was his yeah. first year All-Australian. All-Australian. Yeah, it was his first time as an All-Australian. Yeah, that's very true. Um, and, of course, they have Tom Lynch, in, and Rewalt missed a whole chunk of footy this year with his uh, knees and elbows or whatever it was. Um, so, GWS, on the other hand, they are the AFL's new kids on the block, and they have finally arrived, it appears, after years of people saying they have so much potential. They actually put it together this year. Um, I did say that I thought... You know, late in the season, they might have let this year slip, um, which is not an unreasonable thought because they finished sixth and they lost to Canberra in the sorry they lost in Canberra in the snow to Hawthorne by like ten goals, eleven goals this year. Uh-huh. And at that point, I thought this is terrible. Some people were were suggesting their premiership window had ended this year, like before uh-huh. the finals. What do you think about that? Definitely harsh, considering how heavy their list is. Mm. Even if they lose guys, as people probably expect them to. Mm. they've still got as much talent as anyone, even if they lose some people. That's true. I think... Yeah. Evenly distributed around the ground as well. They've got elite backs, elite forwards, true. elite mids. That's very good true. good distribution. They, they do have talent literally in every position on the ground. No clear weaknesses there. A lot of their players are still in their peak, like Whitfield, mm. Cornelio. You know, Taranto, still, he's got his peak ahead of him. Uh, Cameron's probably in his peak now. Phil Davis, yeah. Nick Haynes. Oh, I can go on. But I think the issue with GWS was potentially retaining some of these players. Yeah. So Cornelio was only locked in a few weeks ago. Um, Josh Kelly signed last year. Whitfield is out of contract next year. But now if they can keep these players, then you can see the dynasty is still yeah. pot- like possible. It was all about retaining these players. So um, they're also, just as a little side note, the only side to knock off Geelong at GMHBA this year, yeah. which is really a good a sign of a good team, especially when that was Geelong's peak. Yeah. You know, they were the best team in the competition at that point. They were um, flowing. Yeah, but generally speaking, they're going to have huge ins this week. I know that this is like a popular narrative of oh, the huge wins GWS have, uh, sorry, the huge ins, um, but we have to mention it. Whitfield, mm. Cornelio and Green are probably three out of their three or four best players. Yeah. Toby Green. Cornelio is a longer shot out of those two, obviously. but Yeah, he's probably been their best performed midfielder this year. Though. Yeah, I mean, it's a long shot to play. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you yes. made it sound like he's a walk-up. Certainly, he's that's a good point. Nowhere near that certain to play. No, that's true. He has been on one week for a number of weeks now. Mm. I think he will get up just even if he's not quite right. Uh, I don't think he would let this opportunity. He happen. even said to himself that if he wasn't right enough to perform the way he wants to, he wouldn't mm. take a spot from someone else. He, yeah, fair He enough. said that himself in the post-game interview. Yeah, okay, interesting. So I guess that's a wait and see. But regardless, Whitfield and Green have been yeah, arguably two. their best two players this mm. year, other than maybe Cameron. Have they answered the MCG question? Because they're not a particularly good MCG side. I feel they've answered it more than, say, Brisbane would have if they were in this position. Yeah. For example. I agree with you. They've probably got more runs on the board there than a lot of the interstate teams. That's true. Their record against Richmond isn't particularly good there. In fact, they've never beaten Richmond at the G. And Richmond are probably the best MCG side in the competition. So that is a huge hurdle for them. Nonetheless, they're probably playing the best football they have ever in their history at the moment. This final series. In terms of like lifting for the occasion. Yeah, they look inspired. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a GWS side play this well. Um, and with those ins as well, you have to give them a chance. It will be a Coliseum like atmosphere this Saturday. How do you think, how many GWS fans, how much orange will you think you see in the crowd? I reckon they probably get 10, 15,000 out of the 100 in there, maybe. Yeah, that, that would be doing well to get that. Um, that is going to make it... Do you think that's going to be a, play a big role? Because I don't think they would have ever... Oh, they probably would have played... They've played, they played in a way prelim against Richmond at the G. Uh-huh. Um, so, I mean, they will get, get some experience out of that. But it's going to be, it's going to be uh-huh. hard. It's going to be hard. Like, this is probably the They most- dealt with it this week, though, to an extent. Collingwood. Yeah, that's a good point. Pass of Collingwood fans. Collingwood's the biggest club in mm. Melbourne. That's a good point. Well, them and uh, Richmond. Richmond's bigger, but yes, uh, the same thing. Richmond's really. bigger because they've won flags recently, so their members are mm. actually buying memberships. But yeah, <laughs> you'd say Collingwood, even when they're shit, still a top three membership sort of club. Yeah, I guess. So yeah, I'd say they're the true. biggest. Yeah. When Richmond go to shit again, their members 
<laughs> it might drop off. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Who knows? They were really, really bad, like in yeah. the two thousands. But anyway, um, yeah, okay, that's true. I guess yeah, this probably will be the most one sided grand final in terms of atmosphere, though. Yeah. Ever if you think about it. On talent, the Giants probably almost have them covered. Yeah, which is ridiculous. I think, think. they do. It's ridiculous to say because Richmond have. Uh, over the whole of the last three years, probably have been the best side. I don't think Richmond's the most talented team, though. They've got some top-end talent, but they know how to maximise what they've got. That's yeah. where their strength lies. In terms of pure names down a list, talent, mm. no one can really touch GWS. I Probably really, I don't think. Yeah, I... Uh, I probably understand. GWS, I'd have to. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying there. Um, Richmond really have a really good system. They're really tough and uncompromising. Guys you know, do what they have to do. Yep, big game... Big game players as well. Um, but that midfield of Cornelio Kelly, Toronto, Hopper, Green, Whitfield and Zach Williams now, mm. uh, that is a really, really frightening midfield. So you have to give them a chance. What they're going to have to do, in my opinion, is score goals early and take the crowd. You can't take the grand final crowd out of it. But what they don't want is to hear the roar of that Richmond faithful yeah. for the first four goals of the game because that, that would mentally have an impact, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. You can't let them build... Anything on you. Can't let Richmond build too much momentum. Yeah. Probably a good way of putting that. Absolutely. What, Even um, if it's goal for goal, that's manageable for a GWS team. But if they mm. let Richmond kick a few in a row, yeah, they'll probably run over the top, I think. Yeah. I can see what you're saying there. Um, one last point before we take a break because the camera's about to run out of time. Yeah, um, clash jumper situation. Mm. Do you care as much as I do about this? I'm not as invested in the jumpers and stuff as you are. I am a traditionalist and I hate class jumpers in a grand final Mm. within reason. One thing that really bothers me about the 2017 grand final is that Richmond had to get up on the podium in their yellow monstrosity of a jumper. Mm. It's disgusting. I would hate if, well, uh, I would hate to see the Eagles play in their yellow class jumper in a grand final. I just, Uh. it's wrong. You got to. So what I'm getting out here is Richmond will obviously play in black jumper, yeah. black shorts. I'm hoping GWS can wear their orange tops rather than that stupid class jumper with just a G on it. Because yeah. like, like, I don't know, like, if you're a free man or fan, it's different for free. free uh, that's, that's my thing. Freo's are virtually the same except the colours yeah. are flipped. And it, that is actually a nice jumper. Yeah. That is a nice jumper. Whereas, like, I don't know. And I, I guess it comes yeah. down to taste. But I just don't think a premiership memory and all the photos and stuff like that should be taken with your club in their shitty class jumper. Mm. I don't like class jumpers in general. But yeah, that's just You my think opinion. you'd have your traditionals for the photos and shit just ready to go. I feel like your team's... So like... what they... I know that Collingwood and St Kilda in 2010 when Collingwood obviously won, but they made St Kilda wear the white clash. Uh-huh. I believe the, the, the plan was if St Kilda had won, they were going to go get changed before they go on the podium. Yeah. Uh-huh. Richmond opted not to. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was their choice. Um, I remember I have a memory of the 2010 World Cup soccer. Spain wore um, like a alternate Guernsey jersey, whatever you call it, and then um, came back onto the field and on their podium got changed yeah. into their normal kit as well. So, yeah. But anyway, maybe other people don't care as much as I do, but that is just my little rant for today's podcast. Fair yeah. enough. Okay, so we're coming to towards the end of the podcast. Bush, now for the real questions. Yeah. First of all, who do you want to win this game and why? This is a tough one. I think I'm inclined to say GWS, but there is a small bitter part of me that doesn't want to see the newest club win a flag before my team that's had a 20 year head start and done nothing. Really, so that'd probably be a slightly bitter pill to swallow, but it'd be good to see them pull it off, I guess, against the Victorian powerhouse, the underdog. Yeah. It'd I probably th- help the game, I guess. Maybe, maybe make a few of those rugby fanatics in Western Sydney give a shit about footy, maybe. Mm. I think everyone kind of accepts that GWS were given a hell of a lot more than Fremantle were, though, mm. to start off with. Fremantle were given a bit, though, from what I've read. We just fucked up with a lot of our early picks and strategy and list management. Yeah. Well, even GWS was given a lot more than the Gold Coast were, mm. and the Gold Coast were, were still given a fair bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we said it the other day. Uh, I don't really want to ham like too much on this, like because I'm not not trying to have a go at GWS in their yeah. game final preview. But um, like I think we mentioned the other day, the Gold Coast when they won the spoon in their first year, that yeah. their first year was a compromised draft, so they didn't even get mm. pick one. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> I would like 
Oh yeah. Which I was going to ask quicker. Which one was it that had the weird draft, but they had to trade? The, that was GWS yeah. that had those top two picks yeah. that had to trade them and not use them, sort of thing. Yeah, I think yeah. it was four players. It was. Um, it was Martin Hogan, Brad Crouch, and um, Whitfield. No, no. Oh my god, Martin and Hogan, Brad Crouch, and O'Meara. Mira, yep, yeah. O'Meara. So three WA yeah. kids. Um, but yeah, Gold Coast didn't get them, although they did end up with two. Yeah, of they those traded for those picks. They just used higher. Yeah, other picks to get them. Yeah, that's right. I would like GWS to win. Um, I've said it before. I, I've, I've always kind of not really liked Richmond that much. Um, I do like Hardwick and Cochin and respect that's, that's Dusty. Where it obviously, ends. not oh, necessarily like him, but yeah. respect his talent sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. Oh, un- undoubtedly, but. Yeah. I guess for me, this is more of like an underdog thing yeah. rather than actually. I don't hate Richmond or anything like that, really. It's just, yeah. it's just probably the underdog status, the yeah. non-Victorian status as well, and just the fact that Richmond won one two years ago. It's nice to see a different color jumper on the podium, whether it be white or orange. Huh? Um, so that's probably why I'm going for them. Yeah. yeah, and they're just obviously further removed as a rival of West Coast. Then like, there's no real yeah. rivalry there. Was West Coast probably have that more. Of a not um, not really like a rivalry with Richmond, but we're kind of on a level. Do you know what I mean? Mm. In the last couple of years, I've also got a tin foil theory here that could support GWS. You you could support the theory that once they win a flag, everyone's out of their hypothesis. So yeah. you could get behind that and hope that your club might be able to poach a bit of the talent floating around there. If that's the direction, a lot of those guys feel like yeah, we'll get a flag mm. with the boys and then. Go back home or whatever sort of thing. Very good point. Could see Lockie Whitfield lining up in the brown and gold next, not yet next year, the year after. But yeah, that, no, that's, that's actually a very viable theory. I've heard that theory before from yeah. people saying they're in it to win a flag together because they know they've got a talented group. And then mm. oh, Josh Kelly, I think, will be out of contract as well. But yeah, he only signed a two-year deal. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Who do you think will win? <sighs> Richmond. Brain definitely says Richmond. What's the margin? Realistically, thinking like if I had to purely use my brain, not my gut and feel and all that sort of stuff, purely brain, I'd say Richmond have one of those grandies where it's a flogging. Unfortunately, really thinking of flogging. I was thinking that's the thing with grandies; they are either tight or a flogging. I've found mm. you don't get any of those like even like four or five goal mm. sort of. You either see an absolute pumping or a couple Cer- of goal. Certainly in recent years, yeah. Uh. My yeah. I was thinking about whether this would be a smashing or not. And I think going into Richmond and Adelaide, Adelaide were hot shit going into that game. Mm. And of course they had the MCG question. I don't think they'd beaten anyone at the MCG that year. I could be wrong on that, but uh, certainly not in finals. Um, also West Coast in 2015 were hot shit, like absolute, probably the former team of the competition going into that. Um, and yet both teams got trounced and will forever be remembered as yeah. that far off Hawthorne and that far off Richmond, but it wasn't necessarily the case. With GWS, you do get the feeling like they're too good to get belted. Mm. But, you know, like you said, we never saw any of those other belts yeah, coming. Yeah, exactly. Even Geelong and Port Adelaide, there was, um, they were fairly evenly rated that year. Mm. I know Geelong was the, probably the better side, but in round 22 of that year, in 2007, Port Adelaide beat them at Skilled Stadium. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I don't think it'll be a belting, but it's it's hard to rule it out mm-hmm. just because it, obviously if it's going to be a belting, you think Richmond's going to win, not GWS. Yeah. GWS belting Richmond seems very unlikely. I'm going to say Richmond by 27. Mm. I think the Giants will. What, what will probably happen actually is that Richmond will stay a few goals ahead and then in the last 10 minutes break the Giants when the game is just yeah. about unwinnable for them. So that's, that's where it could get, uh, not ugly, but like the margin could get yeah. inflated a bit. First goal. Jazz Cameron. I've gone Jack Rewalt. <laughs> There's no point adding much analysis to that. Yeah, it's just yeah. pure like who gets the first goal. Exactly. Uh, Norm Smith. Based on my assumption, Geelong win. Oh, sorry, Richmond <laughs> win. <laughs> Damn, Prestia. Okay, I like it. I like it. I've gone Hawley yeah. um, for no real reason. He's often He's Richmond's best the, player, though. A lot of people reckon he got robbed the year Dusty mm. won it, so that could yeah. be... He definitely was yeah. robbed that year. <laughs> but um, I think he deserves it. He had a great year, yeah. one of their best players for sure. So he's my nomination. Um, before we wrap up this grand final preview podcast, we will take you through the results of the player of the final series that we've got going on right now, uh, where we all vote five to one on every single game of the finals. So I'll just take you through the top five. At the moment, in fifth spot, we've got Joel Selwood with 16 votes. Dion Prestia, fourth with 17. 
Second place is a tie between Nick Haynes and Tim Kelly of the Cats. And in first spot for his amazing BOG performance on the weekend, Brody Grundy, 21 votes. So Impressive Grundy leading considering he's only played two of three possible games that some of the other guys have played. That's true. Very impressive from I th- Grundy. I think he got 15 votes against GWS from us for being <laughs> BOG and then six in the first game yeah. against Collingwood. So, uh, sorry, against Geelong. So... To summarise that, Grundy's leading by 21 ahead of the next best is Haynes, who's the only one who can... Well, uh, Haynes obviously, and Haynes and Prestia are the only two that could realistically... Is there anyone uh, with more than one vote from Richmond or GWS that could get a... Oh, sorry, it's only 15, yeah. Nets on more yeah. than six, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I don't know. There's probably a few other guys if they BOJ, they can That's true. swoop. That's true. I'd have to change tabs yeah. to work that out. It's probably a bit too much. But yeah. um, Haynes and Prestia, if they have a half-decent game... Uh, we'll yeah. probably almost certainly... Pretty much if they poll votes almost. Yeah, exactly right. So, But Grundy obviously won yeah. our Player of the Year award, so if he somehow wins Player of the Finals as well, that capped yeah. off a brilliant year yeah. for him. That's probably the end of True Footy Podcast 38. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say on the Grand Final, Pusher? Can't really think of anything too pressing. Yeah, fair enough. It's been a bloody good year. As an Eagles fan, it's, it's, it's funny to show how entitled we have probably gotten after winning a flag. Most years when your team doesn't win the flag, you're like, ah, shit, oh, well, next year. This mm. year, it does hurt just the knowledge that there will be a new team winning the flag that isn't mine, which is like kind of a unique feeling. I haven't really felt that way for, I don't know, 12, 13 years. So. Entitled and Eagles, those two words go together like <laughs> peanut butter and jelly, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Please. It's just um, sustained excellence that we're used to. Mm. No, but seriously... Um, yeah, so mixed emotions around this grand final, seeing a new premiere, but obviously that's the way it goes. And um, best of luck to both teams. I'm hoping the Giants lift the flag, but, uh, lift the trophy rather, but um, yeah, my tip will be <laughs> Richmond. Thank you for tuning in, guys. Uh, like I said, this I'm not sure if we'll get this up before the Brownlow live stream, but um, you know, <laughs> we're doing one yeah. if I do somehow get this up in time. Um, also, I'm going to do a bunch of videos this week previewing the grand final in different ways, um, rankings videos and stuff like that. Also, I haven't quite ruled out doing a live stream for the grand final. Oh, haven't decided exactly how that's going to go yet, but we'll let you know on social media. So thank you guys uh, for tuning into the podcast and we'll see you somewhere very soon on the True Footy YouTube channel.